Thank you very much for coming. I'm glad to be here. Um, today's topic is going to be about awareness in Indian country. That's sort of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, when I was first asked to do this talk, um, they said, oh, the theme is going to be awareness. And, and I thought, awareness? That just seems so big. What can I possibly do with something called awareness? Um, but, you know, uh, six months and one pandemic later, uh, when I thought I'd come back and revisit this topic, and I said, you know, what was that uh, topic and what's that theme? Um, it's awareness, awareness. Okay. Um, well, I'm aware, I'm more aware now of all kinds of stuff as a result of this pandemic and what's happened to everybody in the last six months that I realized there's also lots of things in my head that I'm aware of as being part of Indian country and living and working in Indian country that uh, other people just might not normally be aware of. And I thought, oh, I've got a stage. I can make you aware of these things. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about COVID. Let's talk about uh, Native Americans. And let's talk about um, urban uh, Native Americans. And I just kind of said, yeah, okay. In, in the Native vernacular, studis, studis. So what are we aware of now that's different uh, than maybe six months ago? Well, one of them, the simple term, is the pandemic. A pandemic is something we may have heard of. If you're a history major or you had a history class, you heard about the Spanish flu, that was a pandemic. But most of us know what epidemics are. You know, we have all kinds of epidemics. We're trying to keep from having epidemics. But now kindergartners know what the word pandemic means. Uh, I didn't when I was in kindergarten, but that's just me. So, and then even something like a virus. We know about viruses, you know, with smallpox virus and HIV virus and you know, chickenpox and you name it, all kinds of viruses. But unless you actually look at, you know, disinfectant labels from here and there, uh, you would never have heard of the word coronavirus. We all know coronavirus now. We know particularly the one that causes COVID, the one that causes the coronavirus disease of 19, 2019. It's something none of us are ever going to forget, no matter how old you are right now. Uh, even something like a simple word like quarantine. Uh, we all know what quarantine is. You know, quarantine means you have to be locked up. You have to be separated from everybody else for a while. You know, we've all seen that movie where the guy comes in the airlock with an alien stuck to his face and you know, the doctors are saying, don't let him in. He needs to be in quarantine. And of course, they let him in and a whole monster movie comes out of that. Uh, but that's quarantine. You know, even something simple like software like Zoom. A Zoom is kind of a software meant for business to have face-to-face -face meetings without having to travel from distances. Uh, we're all learning from Zoom. We're all teaching from Zoom. Zoom has become a verb for us. It's all about talking uh, and communicating with each other in this virtual kind of new environment. Zoom is part of our vernacular. It's part of our lexicon. It's part of our daily language these days. And then in the world of academia, we use the term disproportionate impact in the world of equity and diversity between faculty members and administrators. We talk about how certain students, our African-American male students, are disproportionately impacted compared to uh, the Latin American students or indigenous American students or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, that's a term we used in academia for that. But now we're all aware of disproportionate impact in terms of how COVID is impacting our communities. You know, African-American communities have been hit really hard by this virus. Uh, well, in terms of per capita, Indian countries even been hit harder, um, really hard. So at 27%, that's a lot of people. American Indians at 34% are disproportionately impacted uh, by this virus. Some of you might even be aware of what's happened on the Navajo Nation. We got national coverage. You know, even Fox News did a bit on us. CNN did a bit on us. Um, Navajo Nation, where I'm from, is 300 million people living on one reservation. It is the most highly infected uh, infectious rate of any other community in the entire country, uh, in the entire world, for that matter. Uh, you know, despite the quarantines, despite the curfews, you know, there was a curfew from sundown on Friday to sunup on Monday. Uh, there's a curfew from sundown every day of the week. Uh, it's been a big deal. It's finally getting better. Um, but it's been pretty tough. Uh, and if you might wonder, you know, you might be uh, wondering, why are even natives so disproportionately impacted? Why do viruses hit their communities harder than anybody else? Why are they more susceptible to things like COVID uh, or some of these other viruses? Well, it, it comes down to something like this. It's sort of a historic phenomenon with different cultures and different people around the world living with their animals. Europeans have been living with their animals for a very long time. Their cows, their horses, their goats, their sheep, their pigs, all those kinds of things. Uh, and as a result, we catch what we call zoonotic diseases. We catch animal diseases and become a human version of these things. Uh, there are no domesticated animals like that in the entire Western Hemisphere. They just don't exist. I mean, you know, there's llamas and there's turkeys and there's an iguana and 
um, maybe cochin neal and guinea pigs. There's a few domesticated animals here, but nothing on the scale of cows or pigs or chickens or camels or these kinds of big animals that people lived with. So there are no zoonotic diseases that human beings catch here. It just doesn't happen. Um, but if you do live with your animals, you can catch anthrax from your cows. Uh, you can catch smallpox from your horses. You can catch influenza of all kinds from your chickens. Uh, and you can catch all kinds of things, including bubonic plague from the fleas that feed on all these animals, even your pets. Uh, this, is, this is a population that gets exposed to these diseases more often, and therefore they develop a greater immunity to these diseases. If you're from a population that doesn't get exposed to these, then your body doesn't have any reason to develop antibodies for something you're never exposed to. And that's part of, part of the, the mechanism that happened. People here have just less of an immunity. And there's two types of immunity. Uh, there's what we call innate immunity. Innate immunity, and I'm not going to get into the technical aspects of it, but basically what it is, it's your ability to even recognize a pathogen. So whether or not you actually have a virus or a bacteria that's gotten into your bloodstream, your body recognizes it as a foreign body and does something about it. We actually have special cells that look for these things in our body. Uh, so that's called innate ability. Uh, just the ability to recognize that you have some kind of pathogen. Europeans, because they're living with their animals, have much greater exposure to all kinds of other diseases and therefore have uh, a greater sense of uh, pathogen recognition. And then there's acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is what you get when you get exposed to a disease, a flu or a cold or even chickenpox. You're not born with innate abilities against chickenpox. You catch chickenpox and then you don't catch it again, hopefully. Um, or if you get a vaccine, you get a tiny exposure to it, um, that's called acquired immunity. You, you trigger those antibodies to do something to help fight off diseases. Um, so between the innate immunity and acquired immunity, uh, Native North Americans and South Americans had evolved a different set of mechanisms by which to deal with those things. Uh, basically, they've reduced the number of leukocytes, the abilities to recognize disease, than other populations. European, African, or even Asian populations don't have... Uh, have more of these uh, acquired and um, innate immune systems. And it's purely an accident. It's a purely it's an artifact of the settling of the Western Hemisphere in general. The reduction in gene frequency, the reduction in immunological responses occurs as a result of the bottleneck effect. In other words, smaller populations came over from Asia, whether they came over from Siberia or whether they came over through Polynesia. It's still a small population that settled the hemisphere. And with them, they brought a smaller immunological response mechanisms. And since they were no longer exposed to these things, there was no need to develop any more uh, diversity in that. So you fast forward about 20,000 years, and you get a huge diversity of cultures, a huge diversity of languages and people and traditions, uh, without necessarily changing the immunology of all these people in the hemisphere. Were you aware in 1491 uh, that there were about 120 million indigenous people living in North and South America? That's about one-fifth of the world's population at the time. That's huge. And after contact, as a result of that reduced immunological response, 100, 000, 100 million people uh, passed away as a result of exposure to disease. Uh, and, you know, the Spanish brought it. Um, they're not guilty. They didn't do it on purpose. They didn't know what germs were. Uh, but they are responsible because they did bring it. And to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about, I mean, COVID's been pretty bad. Over 200,000 people have died as a result of COVID. But in the scale of the 15th century, imagine 1.2 billion people dying as a result of COVID. That's the kind of scale we're talking about when one-fifth of the world's population dies from one pandemic. Uh, that's huge. Uh, but given all that, given all that 500 years of stuff that's happened in Native America, I want to emphasize we are still here. Uh, we haven't gone anywhere yet. Uh, are you aware of the fact that we are represented by about 600 sovereign nations within the United States? Uh, 600 separate reservations that are treated as sovereign nations. We actually have treaties with the states and the federal government. We don't have MOUs. We don't have contracts. We actually have treaties like France and South Korea and, and, and Vietnam. Uh, we are a sovereign nation within the United States. Uh, so all these blue dots uh, equal sovereign nations within the United States, including the really big blue one there, which is Navajo Nation. Indigenous America today is about 6 million people. We've gone from 120 million, uh, today's population about 6 million people, which is about 2% of the U.S.'s population. Um, but are you aware of the fact that only about 22% of us live on reservations? You know, people think, oh, Indians all live in reservations. 
Not true. Uh, in fact, 60% of us actually live in urban centers. Uh, so that means about 3.6 million people live in Chicago and New York and LA and all these big urban centers, uh, like lots of other people, uh, move to the cities, leaving only a small percentage of folks that still live out on reservations. We call ourselves urban Indians. That's, that's what we are. Um, you know, like rural America in the 19th century, we moved to the big cities. Sometimes there was government policies that helped push us that way, which is another TED Talk altogether. Uh, but the reality is that urban Indians now actually make up the majority of all Indian people uh, in this country. Uh, yes, there's still a lot of people living on reservations, but it, they're small comparison. So, you know, we're all around you. You might not even realize it. If you meet someone and say, you know, hey, I'm Bob Smith, they don't say, I'm Bob Smith, I'm Irish. Well, we don't identify our tribal entity either, usually. Um, but if you look carefully, you realize we're leaving an imprint everywhere. We have our health centers. We have our uh, public art centers. We have our um, uh, training centers in urban cities, uh, in downtown urban areas, you know, whether it be Seattle or Chicago or L.A. or New York. Uh, we practice our ceremony, our traditional religions, out on the streets in the middle of the city uh, because I, while it might be ideal to be in the canyon or the river or the stream, we do it in the concrete jungle because that's where we live now. And that's okay. It seems to work. You go downtown and you might have a round dance just pop up just as part of some kind of religious ceremony that's, that's coming up. Maybe Indigenous People's Day. Maybe California Indian People's Day. Something like that. You can find us everywhere in urban cities. You can even find us in Washington, D.C. where we have our own representatives uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I want to say look around. Uh, you know, Our beauty, our culture, everything that makes us us is all around you, and you might not even realize it until you look carefully. Uh, we're out there doing this, fighting the same battle you are. We're fighting COVID. We're trying to keep safe. We're trying to wear our masks. Uh, but we're also expressing ourselves and living in Native America in this very 21st century place. Uh, whether you're an artist from Tulsa, uh, an artist from Seattle, uh, an artist from Sacramento, San Francisco, or Raisin Hill in Chicago, skating in Phoenix, um, American Indian people are still very much here. So now you are aware that despite uh, the genocide, despite the government policies, despite all these things, in fact, in spite of COVID itself, many of us wake up every morning and say, you know, today's a good day to be indigenous. Thank you. <laughs>